Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's Heritage Lunch and Learn on expanding relevance through decolonizing heritage. My name is Sarah Carlson, and I'm the program manager of Vancouver Heritage Foundation. And I have the pleasure of being joined by Rina Sutar and Julia Hilbert. We're really delighted to have you here with us this afternoon. Um, so before we go any further, I'd like to acknowledge that the work of VHF takes place on the traditional ancestral unceded lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And many of us might be joining from these lands uh, this afternoon. Uh, some of you might be joining from elsewhere. So I invite you to reflect on the indigenous people whose traditional lands you occupy. VHF is a registered charity that promotes the appreciation and conservation of heritage places in Vancouver. So we do this through educational programming like these lunch and learns, special projects, informational resources, and grants. So we're really excited to be continuing to offer our Heritage Lunch Learn series virtually this year. These lunchtime talks feature current heritage projects and topics, and today we'll be hearing from Rena and Julia on the necessity and challenges of decolonizing heritage. So we're very thankful to have Rena and Julia here to share their experience and insights today. Uh, their presentation will start with a discussion on decolonization with a personal perspective on the racialized experience of heritage. They'll go the answer if it's possible to decolonize our very notion of heritage and then provide some insights on what that can look like on the ground. Rena Sutar is of Haida descent and is the manager of decolonization, arts and culture for the Vancouver Board of Parks and Recreation. Her portfolio includes the ambitious goal of decolonizing the Vancouver Park Board. Among other initiatives, she works intergovernmentally with local First Nations on long-term comprehensive plan for Stanley Park. Rena oversees the first colonial audit of an institution and is seeking to embed the idea of cultural practice being a core service for community and individual wellness. Uh, Julia Halbert is an arts and culture planner with the Vancouver Parks Board's Decolonization Arts and Culture Department. She oversees the Parks Board's public art, monuments, and memorials collection, and supports cultural policy development. Currently, she is working with Kamala Todd to develop a new Indigenous park naming policy and co-leading the citywide commemoration framework. Julia's academic and policy interests focus on decolonization, heritage, and commemoration. Her graduate thesis analyzed a municipal heritage program's response to the truth and reconciliation calls to action. Julia serves on two terms of the city's Vancouver Heritage Commission. And prior to joining the city of Vancouver, Julia was part of the award-winning consultant team that produced the Create Victoria Arts and Culture Master Plan and the Maple Ridges Cultural Plan Update. Uh, so thanks so much, Julia and Rena, for being here with us this afternoon. And I will pass things over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, we are delighted to be here this afternoon to share a little bit of our um, recent work and research into the expanding field of heritage planning um, and its relevance um, to our work within cultural practice development. To start, I would like to um, introduce our own land acknowledgement because our work is built on the understanding and recognition that what is now known as Vancouver is located on the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh nations who have lived throughout this region for thousands of years. Their continuous stewardship of this land is reflected in their oral histories, arts and cultural practices and deep relationships with these lands and waters. That understanding is paramount to this work as it is their living cultural heritage that has been erased, displaced and manipulated by settler colonialism. I will unpack this further as we go along in our conversation today, but just want to ground our conversation within this understanding and acknowledgement. So what is heritage and who is it relevant to? Um, we were invited here today to speak about the expanding relevance of heritage through decolonization. But of course, the very first question that Rena and I had when we um, started talking about this is relevant to whom? Um, who is the public that we are addressing when we start to unpack what heritage is and who it serves? This is something that our department, our newly formed Department of Decolonization, Arts and Culture is actively trying to grapple with. We are taking into account the ways in which cultural narratives are encoded within the public realm and the means through which public policy and programs calcify and perpetuate these narratives. All of the images on the screen here um, are rife with their own histories, stories and symbolism. And at the core is a question of how is cultural value assigned and who determines what the cultural value is. So our civic environment is understood to be integral 
um, component within identity formation on many levels from both the personal, the community, civic to national. However, a discussion of whose heritage is being represented that relates to this identity formation has been missing for a long period of time. And arguably that's why we've been invited here today is to reflect on that changing dynamic and the need for an expanding relevance. So heritage is a facet of cultural history that serves as a way to communicate stories and truths about the past. And importantly, they communicate what is valued in the present. Heritage plays an integral role in this by acting as a medium through which collectively held understandings of truth can be established. Furthermore, heritage within a planning context becomes the civically sanctioned and institutionalized cultural memory. So heritage can be understood as the legacy of culture and as such the dominant culture that drives the formation of the built environment and cultural programs policies are often the ones whose histories and narratives become championed and preserved. Within Canada, that culture is a colonial in origin and nearly half and nearly all of the systems that exist within the field of heritage management grew out of that colonial system. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to Rena to speak about the impacts um, and what that may, um, what that lived experience of being an Indigenous person doing work um, within heritage planning could be like. Thank you, Julia. Um, I imagine your reasons for becoming interested in heritage are varied. Uh, you're clearly interested, it's why you're here. Uh, I don't work in the heritage realm particularly, but I find myself heritage adjacent frequently in my work, decolonizing a municipal system. It falls under the reconciliation and anti-racism umbrella, but at its core, my work is about who we are, who we're being in society, and what stories we tell ourselves. I'm a Haida person deeply invested in narrative and identity, which is why I'm here speaking to you. My impression of local history was mainly through things like the Burnaby Village Museum with its vintage carousel and its old timey costumes and buildings. It's very like many other heritage villages across North America, casting a theme park glow over early settler life. My impression of local history was learned by osmosis through pictures and museums and stories, and even the nostalgia ridden cafes with pictorial odes to early Vancouver. The other formative story I bore witness to was the totem pole area in Stanley Park. I knew many of them were Haida, but I'll be honest, my impression was that they were life-size versions of, versions of those keychains you can buy in Gastown. So don't get me wrong, the, the poles themselves are, are real in the park, they're by Indigenous artists, but they're out of context. They're, they were brought in without local Indigenous protocols, and they were brought in by settlers. My early impression was that they were too colorful or too on display or weirdly placed. Anyway, it wasn't what I knew as Haida, which was the old Masset Village Reserve on Haida Gwaii. But what I was told there and at school was that the Haida were an advanced, culturally rich people. Uh, in retrospect, it strikes me as that you're not like other girls of the Indigenous world. It's not a comparison I ever agreed to. Also notice the framing. Was. Were. The totems, though clearly carved by modern people in living memory, are positioned as, an anthrop as anthropological monuments to the past. The cognitive dissonance, dissonance of past and present indigeneity lived in me for decades unexamined. We, the Haidas of the Poles, were supposed to be dead and gone. The community that I knew and engaged with, uh, that my mom's family lived in, was something different, that was something else. The Poles were the physical equivalent of that social studies class in school. It's the settler gaze told back to me, telling me who I am. Let's back up a minute. Uh, it's important that we have some working definitions of things if we're to communicate with each other. So when I say colonialism, I mean something very specific. The, this definition I don't think will surprise you, but we need to lay things bare. Otherwise, it's just a word with kind of vague feelings associated. So let's get specific. Colonialism is a system designed to take control of lands and resources from other people. All the rest of it, the placement of settlers, the imposition of laws and governance systems, the dehumanization of indigenous populations, 
the cultural genocide, the literal genocide, all of those are tools to enable the people in power to seize and maintain control of the land and resources for the purposes of building their wealth. And the stories we tell serve a function. Our stories say that colonialism happened, was completed, is past. Even if you accept that the land was settled and governed in ways that were unfair to the local peoples, well, that's done now. And we conflate immigration with our perceived inevitability of colonialism. After all, people move around, time marches on, this was always going to happen, right? But immigration is not colonialism. Immigrants are obligated to adhere to the laws of the land. People who came at first contact could have immigrated to indigenous communities. In fact, some did. I hope you can see why that is a risky phenomenon for incoming governments and the ne their necessity to control the narrative to stop that. As Thomas King asserts, it's terribly inconvenient for those currently in power who build wealth off the land and resources that indigenous people are still here. It's tremendously inconvenient if you want to install new infrastructure to extract from the land if Indigenous people still have sovereignty and active laws and social structures. But to acknowledge that is to admit that colonialism requires active participation and ongoing oppression. To admit colonialism is not a done deal is to acknowledge that other models of social structure the Iroquois Confederacy, potlatch economy, systems of wealth redistribution, and limiting wealth so that it doesn't come at the expense of the world around us. These are dangerous narratives to them, not to you and not to me. To me, this narrative is essential if we're to save what we profess to actually value. As you go about your work and lives, I invite you to consider and remember this graphic. These are really conservative estimates based on colonial archeology. span So I mean this with no disrespect to the indigenous people's oral histories, which tell a different story. Uh, time immemorial is something specific that's not represented here. These are estimations based on evidence. This graphic by necessity is based on Western scientific evidence. So this timeline represents the human occupation of Vancouver. That little orange piece at the end represents colonial settlement. So if you invest yourself in your work in honoring and preserving history, ask yourself whose history, which part, how much? I always like to pause there because Rena's words always have such a intense gravity to them. And so when we turn to the question of expanding relevance through decolonization, the question is, can the field of heritage planning as a practice and discipline address the complexities of colonialism and the legacies of injustice that it represents? To review, municipal heritage programs largely function within three parts, management tools in the form of civic plans and policies, a heritage register, which serves as an official inventory, and finally through agencies that deliver public education and awareness, such as the Vancouver Heritage Foundation. To be able to approach how these different um, components are able to move towards decolonization, there's really, it's really multi-pronged and that a redefining heritage has to be paramount. Um, approaching to support decolonization, there needs to be clear transparency as to what the civic values, priorities and decision-making processes are that drive the creation and use of heritage management tools. Uh, redefining heritage allows for a more inclusive and comprehensive approach to heritage, to the understanding of what it is. Is it cultural values? Is it intangible? Is it all? Now, to redefine heritage, there are other um, aspects that need to feed, feed into that, um, some of which is relationship building because relationship building is reciprocal to this and relationships are foundational. Heritage is made through relationships. It's that relationship to the land, to the place, to each other, where cultural flourishes. That's where it occurs. And heritage is a way to contextualize the legacy of heritage, of, of culture, sorry. Um, 
The other aspects of this, of course, are capacity building, um, breaking down silos, exploring living heritage and supporting it, and land and place-based approaches. For capacity building, it needs to be uh, it needs to be a universal approach. So it isn't just about ensuring, you know, that there are more Indigenous heritage planners working within the field, but it's actually about ensuring that all of us have a comprehensive understanding of what heritage is. And I know that this program offers, um, you know, a, a step into that, but it's important that capacity building happens in all different directions. Um, similarly, breaking down silos allows for departments within municipalities to reduce the barriers in recognizing and protecting the different components of cultural heritage, um, including Indigenous cultural heritage, and thus advancing reconciliation. Uh, our department, the Decol Decolonization Arts and Culture, is a fantastic example of that, and as far as we're aware, we're the first, depart um, first department of its kind. Uh, we've brought together reconciliation planners, uh, arts and culture planners, and the programmers that actually do that relational community based work. And again, I, I, I will um, belabor that point that building relationships really is the foundation of culture and it's what creates heritage. And so for us, our new department of decolonization arts and culture brings in those different components to be able to more in a more nimble and reactive way respond um, to the demands of this changing nature of, of what is cultural. What is cultural heritage? What is heritage? How as a municipality, as a park board, are we able to respond to that? And then also, of course, what is our civic duty to that? Um, living heritage, I'm sure, is a term that all of you are familiar with. And of course, it's been occupying a large part of um, the new directions, both internationally, nationally, and locally, um, and how heritage communities are approaching um, ways to decolonize their existing programs, but also to be more inclusive moving forward. And of course, living heritage is a term that reflects an Indigenous worldview, emphasizing the ongoing relevance of heritage to people today and the links between heritage places and people's actions within the present. Again, relationships. Um, and finally, land and place-based approach. This is uh, something that we've been piloting a fair bit um, at the park board um, through different projects most recently. And it's also something that's emerged like, through research and best practices um, across the world as the most effective way really to, to ground the work within heritage and cultural practice within the land. Um, it's also one of the most effective tools to advance decolonization. So land-based tools include language, because language is often a reflection of the place, place names, um, Mount Pacols in Victoria, Mount, Doug, uh, Mount Douglas was changed to Mount Pacols, renamed. We're also working um, here in Vancouver with Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh Nations to name a downtown park. Um, this also language and place names also helps um, to bolster local indigenous visibility, because as Rena spoke to, the one of the most effective tools of colonization was creating a pan-Indigenous relationship so that, um, you know, as uh, Rena pointed out at Brockton Point, there are very few local Indigenous totem poles there. And of course, um, Coast Salish were not known for totem poles to begin with. And so the very notion of bringing in totem poles and creating a tourist attraction was very much about a national identity of displacing local Indigenous peoples. Um, Public art is a phenomenal tool to be able to activate different narratives um, and also create, again, relationships. Um, and as a ceremony, which is, ceremony is something that each of these different facet inhabits. And ceremony is also something that becomes that intangible link from the land to the people through relationships. And there may be some form of cultural expression, a public art, a place name, or, um, or other component that may come from that. So at a broad level, heritage planning should be integrated into cultural planning to break down silos, increase capacity building, redefine heritage, and support a land and place-based approach. This will support indigenous cultural heritage and offer measures and tools for the advancement of decolonization. 
Um, of course, the way that our provincial um, heritage legislation is set up, um, re, you know, I, I'm sure the heritage planners in the room are familiar with this, that it, that is a, certainly an uphill battle, but simply to break down the silos and understand that heritage is not distinct from cultural heritage is paramount to this work and something that we're attempting to do within our department. So fundamentally, the field of heritage conservation in Canada is grounded in settler colonialism. And to move towards decolonization, systems change is required and an indigenous worldview should be centered. Heritage is not bound to material form or building, but it is embedded within the cultural values of a community. The folly of heritage planning is that for too long, it has focused singularly on tangible assets like buildings and monuments. And this rigid interpretation of heritage has become problematic as it only captures one narrative place, the one reflected in the built form. Many cultures, communities, and peoples whose heritage is not represented within the built environment are therefore excluded from the support municipal heritage programs provide in articulating and preserving values. While fundamentally heritage, decolon to decolonize a heritage program requires full scale systems change, the colonial nature of the programs that originate from and they continue to operate within need to be re, well, they need, <laughs> well, they, ne they need to be over, um, overhauled, we'll say, we'll say it that way. Um, however, municipalities can begin with decolonization as a process by revising their heritage program to include intangible cultural heritage. And this would of course lay the foundation for indigenous cultural heritage to then be included and protected. Intangible cultural heritage therefore offers an accessible way for the field of heritage planning to become more inclusive and supportive to reconciliation. And I think programs such as these offer an opportunity to be able to advance that, bring up the capacity of, um, and literacy around the value of intangible cultural heritage and how that relates to indigenous cultural heritage. And thus we are starting to move the dial on decolonization and making heritage more relevant to a larger community, which is what the a civic heritage program really should be responding to. Um, so with that, we tried to leave a lot of time for questions because we are working on a lot of different projects that we thought might be of particular interest and wanted to ensure that there is time for, um, for questions to be asked. Absolutely. So if anyone has any questions, you can feel welcome to put those into the chat maybe do we want to start do you, you have an example of a project you're currently working on that you could kind of talk through what the process has been like for that sure um Karina, i how about the colonial audit i was just thinking that might be something very interesting um to share because as we talked about initially let me just go to this slide here so when we talk about relevant to whom we need to understand who it is that um, the heritage programs and heritage planning programs have been created by and for. Um, so the park board, and I'll, I'll let Rena um, explain, but it, uh, Rena, as far as I'm aware, was the, the first um, person to come up with the notion of a colonial audit to take into account of who and what um, has been driving the cultural formation within an, a civic organization. Thanks, Julia. Yeah, so the, the colonial audit is something that um, we are working on and we should be coming out with a report, um, the initial report later this year. But the purpose of it is to, we're calling it a number of things. One is colonialism by the numbers. Um, the, the idea is to daylight what the park board has been for, what was our mandate? And how does that manifest? Because parks, we sort of think of parks as being this like culturally neutral space. Uh, and it's not. If it was culturally neutral, it would be uh, completely untouched by human hands. The thing is, it hasn't been untouched by human hands for thousands of years. So we came in and we made changes. We, you know, put in grass and we uh, chose plantings and we cleared some bits and made walking trails and sea walls and all kinds of things that changed the landscape. Uh, and then there are some very distinct ideas of, you know, who all of that is for and what kinds of things we're, we're sort of the, um, 
where the authority right now that determines what is and isn't allowed to happen in parks or who isn't or isn't allowed to be there doing what. Um, and so a colonial audit is really meant to uh, really explore a lot of those things, like how, you know, how much land does the park board even have jurisdiction over? How does the, the cultural landscape manifest itself? We don't have any signs in Hunkaminam or Skohomish, which are the, the languages of this land. They are all in English. We are we have an entire department of landscape architects. And they all were informed by a landscape architecture, you know, discipline that is rooted from somewhere, but it's not rooted here. So the, the colonial audit is kind of digging into a lot of questions of like, how did we get here? What what is the current state analysis? And we're not meant, we're not doing a, a complete analysis of like absolutely everything. Um, that is colonial about the park board, but more like a core example analysis of, you know, what are the different ways that we uh, exert our authority and how is how does that manifest? Who is that serving? Thanks, Rena. I'll, I'll also add that the colonial audit is um, dovetailing into the work that the city is doing uh, collaboratively with the park board to develop a commemoration framework. Um, and part of that is, again, taking into account of what our history has been to date. Um, how we've been approaching commemoration, how we have been codifying these different cultural values and uh, within the public realm. And part of that, we do need to understand, again, it's like the truth before reconciliation. So we need to understand what came before so that we can do better moving forward. I see Andrea's question in the chat. So I'm I would love to speak to, to this one. Sure, okay. Uh, why don't um, I read it out just for the benefit of the yeah. uh, panel. Um, I would love to learn more about the naming of parks and wonder, wondering how the barge chilling beach sign was able to be erected so quickly when a sign was either in Squamish or Hunkaniman languages would have been more appropriate and can be used as a tool to educate local residents and tourists. That's a great question, Andrea. This is a great question. And I love that this story of the barge chilling beach sign is cracking open this discussion because this touches on so many important things. But uh, what I would like to do is uh, suggest what it what, what the repercussions would have been had we put in a sign that quickly with Skohomish and Hunkamatum. And to do that, to be able to respond that quickly, the park board holds jurisdiction, you know, that in, um, in contradiction to indigenous sovereignty, we are the ones who put in the signs. So if we were to put in a sign, that would be us deciding what sign needs to go in, what kind of information needs to be on there. And then for that to happen really quickly, we would have um, either pressed the nations into um, diverting their language specialists from important language revitalization work to come help us with this sign. We do recognize that language, uh, the presence of the local indigenous languages is critical and it is something that I think we all want to see. I think it would help a lot of citizens of Vancouver feel more connected to the longer history of this place. And right now our presence is interrupting that, you know, our, our kind of colonial presence is interrupting that ability to connect in a broader sense to the entire history, not just what came before, but the entirety of the history. So I would say, and also there's another principle that uh, is really important around uh, indigenous language sovereignty. So one of the 11 reconciliation strategies um, says that we recognize that indigenous sovereignty includes indigenous language sovereignty. So we try not to just decide we want to put some indigenous languages in here because the that would be putting the nations in the position of responding to every single one of our requests so instead we're working in broader um broader ways to say what what are your priorities how can we kind of leverage what we've got here to help increase visibility on the land so all of that work is being done um but because we're trying to do, undertake it in a good way in collaboration with the nations it's slower it's not as visible it's not as sexy and big and flashy and, and fresh and new. Yeah, and I, I try not to be defensive because actually I love I love that that sign was put up, which by the way was a super temporary sign. It was not very robust. <laughs> it was really easy to knock up a quick like bit of plywood. Um, but yeah, I love I love that that kind of thing has prompted people to ask these questions because we've been trying to get that gets a spotlight on that for some time now. Absolutely. Anything you wanted to add, Julia? 
Yeah, I'll just add that we are working actively with um, with staff from the nations on developing a new park naming policy. Um, very much informed, as Rena said, by uh, a sensitivity to the limitations um, and capacity that's available um, within each of their um, language departments, but also to the ongoing nature of doing intergovernmental work. I mean, it's constantly changing. And we have to move slowly and in a good way with that, because the very active, like, you know, just to pull it back, the very active in saying, would you like to name a park on your stolen lands needs to be acknowledged. Like we, there's, there's a very delicate balance here where we're trying to learn and do better. Um, but to do so, it, as Rena said, it can't be sexy and flashy and in the press all the time because that is actually quite a hindrance to develop these, these long-term deep relationships. And we've been working very closely with um, staff from the Three Nations over the last year and a half on name, creating a new name for Smythe and Richards, which is a new downtown park. And I'll share that the um, at the outset of this process was an understanding that language and name is a gift. And that gift has to be met in reciprocity. So again, to what I think what Rena was you know, speaking to was like, it's really easy to put up a sign and slap a name on it, that's fine. But actually what it represents is so much more and that gift to be, um, has to be met in reciprocity. So um, for example, at Smythe and Richards, we've indigenized, like we worked very closely with an indigenous plant knowledge holder, Cease Weiss to indigenize the planting um, plant list. We also um, worked, we've created a, an indigenous um, a curator position for the park. Um, there's going to be an Indigenous public art program specific to the Three Nations for emerging artists at the park site. Um, there's many different layers because, you know, taking Deborah Sparrow's um, ethos of blanketing the city, we're trying to take that um, idea of blanketing all of these different projects and bringing in that Indigenous perspective to it, which means having Indigenous people involved, having Musqueam, Squamish and Slay with feedback on all of these projects, and that takes time in consideration and also yet yeah, the barge chilling park was a, a great learning opportunity but also a good example of a misstep where we thought it was a um you know the park board put it up as a bit of a holiday cheer and it struck a chord because we have been doing this work this deep relationship relational work for years and it was very much at odds with what we had been trying to um move forward with but i we're hopeful that in the future um yeah, we'll be able to take more of a, a collaborative approach to that and not have um, holiday cheer pieces <laughs> be so um, inflammatory. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely difficult, I think. Once you start tugging at the thread of colonialism, <laughs> you realize how little we actually, um, how easy it is for our system to just keep on doing what we were doing all, all along. Yeah. Um, and I'm looking at this next question, uh, which I'll read out. Um, and I, I thought, Julia, I would uh, answer this quickly and then turn it over to you because you're working on the naming stuff. It says, I'm wondering about the larger, broader question of naming pl places after people at all. My understanding is that naming places after people is not the traditional Indigenous way of naming places, and so is therefore colonial. What is your feeling about that? Uh, I definitely have very strong feelings about this, but um, I'm a bureaucrat. I'm not supposed to stick all my feelings into the work. <laughs> Um, however, uh, I do think that this touches on the very idea of heritage. What are we, what are we valuing? It's not just, it's not just about values either, because, you know, we can all say, well, we value community, but when we name something after a person, that's not about community, that's about an individual. So I would say that naming things after people or putting in statues or, uh, in some cases, plaques, that's about veneration. That's about telling us who we're supposed to respect and honor. Um, so yeah, naming places after people. I also think that, you know, some of the nations I, I've seen on, on some of the reserves, they name streets after people, for example. And I don't necessarily think that's wrong. That's per they're perfectly within their rights to, you know, obviously. But that, be <laughs> that being said, um, I would personally love to see us move towards uh, naming a naming practice that would strengthen our relationship to a place because we live, in a, we live in a city with a lot of very distinct places and they are very special and we feel it. We feel many thousands of years of history on this, on this land. 
Uh, and I would love to have names that just in, encourage us to um, build a relationship with the place, not with some person who might have had a connection to there. Yeah, thanks, Rena. I think, Susanna, to answer your question, because we are actively um, developing a new naming policy right now, which is looking at that question of will we allow for and encourage individuals to be commemorated through naming opportunities within the public realm. And I, like Rena, I have very strong feelings about that. But I also think that moving forward, like we just, we can't recognize individuals within the public realm. It is just too difficult with the changing nature of how communication, how people are remembered. It's just deeply fraught and complicated. You know, I, I don't know what the outcome, we haven't done our public consultation yet. So of course, like this is going to be a public process. So um, I'm not sure what the outcome will be, but I can speak personally that I just don't think um, even from like a, you know, from an academic perspective, I think that that's what um, a lot of the literature is pointing towards is that individuals being recognized within public realm is just not appropriate or suitable. I would also note that an indigenous worldview often centers the land and it's about again that relationship to the land and so when we move towards naming and working with the host nations on those processes the conversations are often about the history of that particular place the relationship of of their stories to that place and of people both contemporary and historical so um, that's certainly the direction that we're moving towards at this point yeah, I think the um, of the the indigenous place names that I know, um, they're all very distinctly about what happens at that place, um, which I find really interesting because that is first of all more informative. <laughs> you know, this is this is the place where we go and witness witness celebrations. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it, it's lovely. And I, I do think that um, one of the things that's really missing is, you know, not just the, not just acknowledging Indigenous history and presence, which is critical, we really do, that's so, that's a huge gap, but also recognizing that there is a whole city full of people who don't necessarily see themselves represented in the public realm. And that's kind of the issue of like having one individual. How do, how do we address that? How do we address the fact that the individuals who are commemorated in the public realm are really a, a kind of carefully curated collection to tell us what we're all about. So how do we how do we look at the public realm as something that people can see themselves reflected in? There are lots of histories in this city, even from after it became a city of peoples who are present here who still don't see themselves reflected. Yeah, that kind of ties into one of the, the questions about like, reckoning with those difficult histories that are already existing, right? Creating a naming policy for a place is, is a new process, but how do you kind of take that back and say, this is already here, how do we grapple with that and how it's being seen and does it need to stay, does it need to go? Is there an example maybe you could share about that kind of process? Yeah, I will say that we're, so right now as part of the commemoration framework, we are looking actively trying to understand how the city, both park board and city should reckon with the emblems of difficult histories um, and traumatic histories and in individuals that are currently enshrined within the public realm. And, you know, I, I say enshrined because they really are. When you have a bust of an individual that represents a traumatic history on a plinth um, in a place of prominence within the public realm, yes, people just passively experience it, but there is an active claiming of space and claiming of authority when we do maintain these, um, these works, whether they're public art memorials or otherwise, you know, the very act of the fact that we have staff that are hired with the um, assignment of maintaining them, of um, prioritizing their general maintenance is important. We need to note that. And it's something that, uh, you know, we've received both park board and council direction to pursue a commemoration framework to be able to address that. And there's something that's happening worldwide right now. There are um, jurisdictions um, actively trying to understand how to do better. I would, at this juncture, I would, you know, I, I 
I love to say it, but um, stay tuned for the uh, broader public engagement next year um, in early 2023. Um, but you know, we're we're we will actively be going out to this community, to the heritage communities um, to receive feedback on how do we reckon with that? Because right now we're taking very much a, you know, a, a responsive approach. I think the Gassy Jack is a good example of that where those conversations again, because they're relational, were happening, happening behind the scenes, but there wasn't a public face to that. Um, and so community took action because they weren't aware that these, you know, that um, the city had invested in a deep um, conversation with Squamish Nation about the future of the sculpture. And so then we're put in a position where we need to be reactive. Um, there's other examples, like there was a Christopher Columbus statue in a, um, in a, in the PNE city of Vancouver park very confusing jurisdiction for that park. Um, but uh, there was a Christopher Columbus statue and we quietly removed it. The city quietly removed it about a year ago, you know, in anticipation and also in recognition of the fact that the sculpture was not reflective of the community's values. But these things are very challenging. And I think, uh, you know, any of the other um, municipal employees know the levels of, as Rena says, when you start tugging at the levels of bureaucracy and the threads of, um, agreements and donation requests and so forth, um, things unravel quite quickly and you're left with a lot of different new policies that need to be created quickly, which is a challenge. Was there anything you wanted to add, Rena? Uh, yeah, I think just really briefly about uh, on that topic, because I, I think Julia covers these things beautifully, actually. I, I, we work together and I still learn every time she speaks. <laughs> this is very cool. Um, but on the subject of uh, reckoning with the difficult, the, the problematic histories that we have, uh, I know that there's always the argument that, you know, well, we can't just erase history and we don't should just delete it out of the landscape. But as a, as a writer and someone who's very invested in all kinds of narratives, uh, it hurts me to think that someone actually thinks that a statue is presenting a, the complex narrative that needs to be had in the public realm. <laughs> a statue does not do that. A statue is not a book. It's not a challenge. It's not anything. It's, a, it's, it's clearly a veneration. That's why they literally on plinths. We don't see statues that are at ground level. Um, so yeah, when people say, okay, well, let's tell that story then, then, then that piece requires recontextualization. So that's another piece of, I think, of considering what can be done. Um, with these with these figures and and things in the landscape. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I think um, I'm sure we could probably have a rich conversation with all in the room about the different approaches to um, to reckoning with those uh, difficult histories. But one thing I will say is that if it concerns indigenous history, we're going to listen to the host nations and what they want. Um, this is their unceded land. Um, and I think that that can often get lost in the conversation. So I just want to bring it back to that comment. Thanks for that. Kind of tying back in, you, truth and reconciliation has come up in a couple um, in examples and instances. Um, and I'm just wondering if we can unpack a little bit more, how does truth and reconciliation relate to decolonization? How do they work together? For me, truth and reconciliation is uh, kind of the crowbar. It was, you know, it, it's got a real, um, a real history around it, starting in South Africa, and um, there are some very specific things that are associated with truth, truth and reconciliation. To me, decolonization is um, is about kind of getting more to the heart of the issue. What caused all of this? Why do we need truth and reconciliation, and what can we do about that? Um, the current system that we're in um, is benefiting a certain group of people. Do we want to continue that that way, or, or you know, what are the options on the table for governance, for uh, community care? Because we don't just have to turn to um, Western European examples. We have a whole host of examples to look towards. I see another question in the chat here. I can read this one out. Some places which are important to the nations are secret. What approaches are you taking to protect both the sanctity, but also the privacy of these meaningful spaces? Yeah, a great question. I will say that it goes back to relationships. It's about building those trusts. One of our colleagues, Marie Lopez says that 
uh, projects move at the speed of trust. And I think that really that's what, um, when considering place names and sacred histories and stories associated with a particular land or place, um, we have to be very careful in how we step and we're learning, we're actively learning how to do that. Um, and that's certainly part of, um, there's many different projects going on both at the park board and the city that are working with this. And yeah, maybe I'll let Rena speak to that because you're probably more familiar with the. Um, yeah, I've got a bit of a long history of this, actually. And one of the things that I've come to understand about the principles of working with the local nations is that we haven't even tried working with the basics yet. Have we tried manifesting a land acknowledgement in every possible way in every place that we have jurisdiction over? And yet we go to them again and again, thirsty for more stories. We want more information. Tell us, tell us your, you know, tell us your sacred places. That's none of our business, honestly. Like we, we know enough to be getting on with um, taking responsibility for the narrative that we've overlaid on the land. We know enough to, to work with that for now. Um, however, there are some places that, uh, you know, could be at risk. And there are a number of different ways to handle something like that. It's really challenging in places like Vancouver, which are pretty accessible, like every square inch of it is pretty accessible, right? So it's difficult to like block something off and say, don't walk here. Um, I do know of other places uh, and, and specific examples where um, th places have been kind of sectioned off as being sensitive areas. And the implication being it's environmentally sensitive, which it probably is, but also it's, you know, archaeologically sensitive and culturally sensitive. And if we just kind of go, it's a sensitive area, just keep out. So that's one of the tools that we've got. But I mean, the, the difficulty, and we know this as well, is that um, when and it wasn't even that long ago, this is like the 70s, 80s even, when people would find out that there was a, an archeological site, they would go with, um, with their kids and buckets and shovels and try to find some, some um, interesting tidbits. Um, so we also know that those sacred places and the, and the you know, sensitive places are things that we have to handle gently. Um, we have to be really careful um, where this information goes. And, you know, the nations, I am an Indigenous person. I know that we, there's so many aspects of our culture that we drove underground and it's even hard to come by for us because if it doesn't get passed on from one generation due to trauma or whatever, it can be lost. Um, but it's also super necessary because we've also seen how, you know, when some people get a hold of a little bit of culture, it becomes a, it, it becomes a something it becomes the totem poles at Brockton Point, right? Um, I think, thanks for sharing that, Rena. I think just maybe to summarize um, and to answer Susanna's question, um, we are moving carefully with this work um, to be able to respect um, their privacy and also humbly, you know, we, we are not going with the expectation that we need to be the safeguards for that information. That again, goes back into the capacity building, like universal capacity building, both within um, you know, settler colonial systems, such as the local government, but also within fund providing funding for the nations so that they have more staff to be able to support their own language work and their own cultural mapping work. And I myself have signed NDAs when it, be, when it comes to sharing some information that would be helpful in the planning but knowing that that information is probably not something that should be shared widely, we, we sign NDAs. And it usually, it was a really weird thing to try to navigate our system through because ordinarily we make people sign NDAs. It does not go back the other way. So it was, a, we were met with a lot of like confused stares when we were trying to make that happen. <laughs> but we got it done, people understood. Wonderful, thanks for that. Is there anything else as we kind of wrap up that, that you wanted to share on the topic? I think I mostly want people to really consider, like look around and, and see what you see reflected. Um, if, if I could get everyone to internalize one concept, that is that there are no culturally neutral spaces where human hands have touched. Because uh, I think the biggest thing is that mo mostly people are like, 
turning to Indigenous people to try to solve all of these things. And actually, the problem is the invisibility of this, uh, of the water that we're swimming in. So if you can look around and realize that none of it is culturally neutral, then you start seeing things in a different way. And then you can, I think that kind of works to um, lead in a lot of different directions for a lot of different types of thinking for decolonization. Julia, any final thoughts? Thanks for those, Rena. Oh, no, I, I can never follow Rena. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know what, it, I actually, I, I do want to share this actually, because this is, I think, super relevant to uh, maybe a lot of the audience here is like, how do we, how do we, how are we supposed to do this work? Like, these are big concepts and how do we uh, implement it? But I think this might be a good object example of how this works. I'm the manager of decolonization arts and culture. You can see that I don't have a specific um, expertise in heritage. I've, I don't have that training. I don't have that expertise. Julia has it. So we work together and that's how this work gets done. Um, but I think, yeah, if, if um, I'm really grateful for these opportunities, I'm also really grateful to be able to work with Julia because like I said, I, I learned so much and the more I kind of peek at something like heritage, I'm like, holy cow, yes, all of this, we have to, we have to think more and talk more about all of this. Yeah, it's fantastic. And just, just a huge thank you to both of you for joining us and, and for, for having these conversations. They're so, so important. Um, and your perspectives are so valuable in all of us as we're, we're, we're also doing this work. Um, so hopefully more, many more conversations to be continued um, with this. Um, and thanks everyone who joined us this afternoon for your questions. They're great. Um, always nice to connect with everyone. We do have some resources on our website that are kind of address some of these topics. A starting point, there's lots of information out there. Just wanted to mention that our next virtual uh, lunch and learn is on a similar topic. Um, so um, Janice Alpine and Alana will be exploring kind of their learning surrounding uncomfortable reality of inclusion, collaboration, and partnerships with Indigenous neighbors. So they'll be talking about their project um, more in the interior of BC. So another really good example of, of how some of these, these um, decolonization strategies are being implemented. So yes, thanks everyone for joining us. And um, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your Thursday. <laughs>